We live in an interesting world, don't we? I mean, things are just so, so strange now. I just, I just read an article. <clears throat> Young man, African American, is going to sue the hospitals. Because on the outside of the hospital, it says, please, this is a smoking-free zone. We would appreciate it if you would smoke outside. And the young man says that's a race, racist act. It's racial. It's prejudice against African Americans. Because at one time, the word smoke free meant African free. Back in the early 1900s. And he feels that if an African American goes to this hospital and see smoke free that he may run away because he's afraid that they don't want him there and so he's suing the hospital strange stuff you you know why he's suing right money strange strange stuff that's happening in our world mr brown our governor just signed it into law that it is no longer illegal for underage prostitution. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Under the idea that we don't want our underage people to go to jail because they're looking for food and trying to provide for themselves, so he made it illegal to arrest them, which makes it legal to prostitute yourself, basically. They know what they're doing. They know how to word these things. We're living in a crazy world, guys. And we really need to wake up. And you know who I blame? You know who God blames? The church. It really is our fault. It might not be your fault. We may be the remnant that, that's uh, standing up and we're praying and we're doing what we need to do. But it really is the church's fault because we're the ones that have elected these officials or not elected them by not voting, by not getting involved, by not signing petitions and so forth. You know, if the Harvest Crusade... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> is is definitely saving this year, what, almost 20,000 people? Where are those 20,000 people? Why aren't they signing petitions? You know, why aren't they doing those things? And I totally get, I know, I understand some Christians are st stepping back and they're just kind of, well, God's going to do what he's going to do. Yeah, that's true, but we got to do what we need to do. And God has called us to walk righteously, to be light, to be salt in this world, to stand up for righteousness, to stand up for the widows and the orphans and, and so forth. That's what God has called us to do. And that takes character. And so this evening's theme is character or characters. And there's a difference. Caricatures, you know what caricatures are? They, they are those little figures, cartoons that you draw, and they're kind of funny looking. And, and that's what I mean by characters with the S, is that either you have character or you're a character. Because that's what we have here, which I find totally amazing that God would use this family. As I was reading this and studying this today, I, I'm just like, Lord, <laughs> you definitely have a lot of grace and mercy because Jacob is such a deceiver and a conniver. But not only Jacob, because he learned it from someone, his mother, who is also just as bad as he is. Amazing. And so how important is character? When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost, is what Billy Graham said. Derek Hill said this, character is what defines you. It's what people see in you. It's what people will say about you after you pass away. Character is the one of the most important things you have. How are you investing in yours? Do people see your faith in what you do? Is your character reflected in how you serve the kingdom? Remember that when you pass away, Jesus will either say, Welcome, brother or sister. Good job well done, or I never knew you, be gone. You have a right now. You, you have right now to decide what your future holds by having character. And we're going to talk about that character today as we look at Jacob, Isaac even. Isaac, uh, he, he's just as manipulative as 
Jacob is because he's trying to manipulate the birthright from Jacob and give it to Esau because he likes Esau more than he likes Jacob. Even though God told him that uh, Jacob was going to have the birthright. And Esau, of course, is just as manipulative. It's just amazing as you look at this family. <clears throat> have you ever known, and I know you have, you known somebody that was just dirty, rotten scoundrel? You know, they're just a bad individual. You just look at them and you go, how do they get away with what they do? It's just amazing. And it just seems like that, that they're arrogant, they're selfish, they're dishonest, but for some reason they're born with a silver spoon and they just get away with everything. They're rich and wealthy and, you know, it just doesn't seem fair at all. And you probably know some people like that, whether it's at work, whether in your neighborhood, or whether it's some person that you might idolize because they're an actor or some politician. Jacob was a despicable character, a cheating, stealing leech. Yet everything seemed to go his way. Everything seemed to go his way. Without, not without consequences, though. Jacob's story is one of those long stories of self-centeredness, deceit, and yet success. And as we read it, in the back of our minds, we need to ask that question. Why why was he such a rotten character, and why was he blessed so profoundly? And I think the reason is because of God's plan and grace. God's plan and grace. He promised Abraham that the seed would come from him, and he was going to fulfill that promise no matter how rotten the character that person had. And he does. Now that gives me hope, doesn't it? Because I know that we probably are not as rotten, or maybe we are <laughs> as rotten as Jacob at times, because I think we kind of can fit in this category from time to time, where we manipulate, where we try to work our way through, where we're scoundrels ourselves because we want something, and we think we can get away with it. And you know what I'm talking about, because I know what I'm talking about. And yet God's grace is there. It, that, that's the mystery of the gospel, isn't it? It's the grace of God. It really is. And we're going to talk about it on Sunday. I'm going to talk in length about sin. I really feel that the reason that we're not as excited as we should be is because we don't know how depraved we really are and how much God has really forgiven us. If we... <clears throat> let, let's say that you just happen to... to you're walking somewhere and, and all of a sudden this big semi is driving really fast and you don't see it for whatever reason because you're, you're, you're on your phone looking for those little creatures, you know, and then all of a sudden you go to step off the curb and you would have been hit and smashed in a hundred million pieces, but someone grabs you and saves your life. How appreciative would you be? You'd be pretty appreciative. I think you'd buy them more than just a, a, a lunch, right? I mean, you'd probably be at their house. You'd be, it would just be amazing. And yet, God has literally done that, saved us from the very pit of hell because of our sins. And we should be appreciative. But we don't like to think about our sins. We don't like to hear sins. In fact, there's preachers that won't even share sins because it offends people to say that we're sinners, because we bought into the cultural lie that we're actually good by nature. When we're not, the Bible teaches the opposite. So let's go ahead and look at this story. There's a lot of verses here, and I'm going to run through them kind of quickly, and then we're going to talk a little bit more on character. Verse 1, Now it came to pass when Isaac was old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field and hunt game to bring it. So at this point, Isaac is old, he's blind. He loves Esau, and so he asks Esau, I want you to go fetch your weapons, your bow, your quiver full of arrows, and I want you to go out to the field and find some game, and I want, I want your best stew. You know the stew that you make me every so often, the stew that I just like 
I just want to taste because I just enjoy it so much. I want that stew. I don't know how much more time I have, and so I'd love to just have some of that stew. And then I just want to bless you. I just want to give the blessing of God to you before Jacob gets it, basically, and then I can die in peace. I think Isaac wants to bless Esau. I think it's what he really wants. It's not what God wants, but it is what he wants. And at this point, Isaac's about 140 years old. He was blind, and because his older brother Ishmael had died at the age, he probably thought that he was going to die around there, but he didn't know. Ended up living 40 years longer, died at 180 years um, old, but figuring that he was dying, he called Esau, that he might just give him the blessing. Esau is probably around 27 years old at this point, which makes sense because he's a hunter, takes skill, practice and he has plenty of time to practice and go out there and has homed in on that skill to kill a game but it does take time to find the right animal to kill and and then to hunt it down and then to slaughter it and to prepare the food Um, today what we do hunters which is i find interesting uh, you have people that will actually set up um, feeders out there in the field or in their property if they're, they have a lot of property and they'll set up feeders so that deer will come and feed there throughout the season. And then they'll put a little little perch up on a tree and once in a while they'll just sit up there to see what kind of deer come and so forth. And they'll just wait. And then when the season's right, when season's opening, whatever the laws are, they'll sit up there and when a big one comes, boom, that's how they hunt, hunt deer now because they draw them with the food because they're regularly going. That's not hunting. I don't think that's hunting at all, though they, they enjoy that. Hunting is, is going out and finding it, you know, tracking it, whatever you need to do. That's a real hunter, and I think that's what Esau was. He was a man's man. And so Isaac wanted some delicious food that his soul might bless Esau. And Isaac is deliberately seeking to circumvent God's plan here. If you recall, the blessing was given to Jacob. But Isaac favored Esau and tried to move out of God's plan. And so Isaac is acting in the flesh. He's acting in the flesh here. Now Rebecca, she's listening, as moms do so quite often, as their children are speaking in the living room or in the bedrooms to hear what's going on. So she opens her ears and she hears Isaac speaking to Esau as to what was going on and that the blessing was going to be taken away from her son. And so she's going to do something about it. As you remember that she was having difficulty with her pregnancy and asked the Lord, what is going on here? And the Lord said, there are two nations within you and these two nations will be at battle. From this point on. So because Re- Rebecca knew this, then she heard Isaac was about to be blessing Esau, and so he did something about it. These two nations, these two people were at enmity, fighting over the blessing of God, and that's why they're at battle with one another. You might have a sincere heart, pure motives in wanting to see God work being done in ministry or in family, but God's work must be done in God's way. has to be done in God's way. That's what's so interesting about the work of the Holy Spirit is homing in on listening to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit is leading you. Because you can always have the right heart. A heart for ministry, a heart for work, but it might not be what God is doing at that moment. I remember hearing Pastor Chuck quite often say that there are times when people will come up and say, I got this great idea, let's, do, let's run with it. And he just says, well, let me pray about it. And then he doesn't feel like the Holy Spirit is leading him to do that, so he won't do it. He wants a f- leading of the Holy Spirit. It's a great idea, wonderful idea, may work, but it's not what he can see at this moment that the Spirit is leading. I mean, ask Moses. M- Moses you know, had a heart for the Israelites, and he saw this argument taking place between, between an Egyptian and an Israelite. And so he came in to help the situation. You remember that? And then he looked one way, looked the other way, and then he ended up killing the Egyptian. And, and that pretty much sent him into the wilderness for 80 years. So he had a heart, but he did it the wrong way. Probably shouldn't have done that. Should have waited on the Lord to move him. But you can see God's work must be done God's way. I mean, ask David that. 
Ask David. He ran into the same problem. Ask Solomon. Ran into the same problem. How do you do it God's way? I know we've had problems here in this church from time to time because people don't understand uh, the authority that God has set up in the body of Christ. We were in Ephesians chapter 4 today, and it was the chapter that Forrest taught out of at the men's uh, retreat, and so we kind of went over how God calls pastors, teachers, evangelists for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And I made the point that we've lost that, that respect and honor for those that God has called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I posted something on Facebook, and it was interesting. I just wanted to kind of see what would happen, which, because there's two, two, two pages for Harupa Valley, our Harupa Valley, and what's going on in Harupa Valley, and you can obviously see which one is conservative and which one is liberal now. I, I saw that, and I posted something about the marijuana uh, uh, plants being closed down. The one on Etiwana was supposed to be closed down. Someone said it's already running up and running again. And so I just made a comment as I'm glad that it's closed down because we need to get rid of those things. And I posted an article that had just come out on, on the bad effects of marijuana. And boom, you know, just started slamming. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. Reuben, you ought to do your homework, you know. And another guy, what about Genesis chapter 1, verse 29? And you call yourself a pastor, you know, and it's just degrading and this world has no respect. Used to be a time when they respected pastors, where they wanted pastors' advice, where where presidents would have Billy Graham and say, "Hey, we need some spiritual advice here." But today they don't need they don't need that anymore, and we've lost that. We've lost that in the church, and yet that's God's way. Is it not? Is it not God's way? He's called the pastors and the leadership to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Isn't that God's way? But we don't want to do it that way. We're going to do it our way. And that's why it doesn't work out. We need to get back to basic biblical truths. Now in verses 6 to 17, we notice that Rebecca wants to help God out, so she takes advantage of Isaac's weakness. So Rebecca, verse 6, spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother. Bring me game and make me savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Now this is strange talk from a mother to a son, isn't it? Don't you think it's strange? Here is a son who is probably, what, 27, like Esau, right around there in that age group, and she's talking to him like, oh, this is what I heard, son. Like they tell each other secrets about what dad and your other brother are doing all the time, you know? It's kind of strange talk. You have to ask yourself, what kind of relationship did they have, you know? I mean, did they do this at other times with neighbors and friends, you know? Hey, you see that toy over there? I think you ought to have it. How can we get it? You know, let's scheme in, let's take it away from that neighbor. You know, I I don't know, it doesn't say, but you just have to wonder what else uh, they manipulated people out of. Strange relationship. But go now to the flock and, and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, she says to... Um, Jacob, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. And then you shall take it to your father, that it may, that he may eat it, and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. He's a mama's boy, probably used a lot of lotion, you know, hang around mama for a while. <laughs> Who knows? Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. I love that. Uh, He might feel me and and he might think I'm a deceiver. Uh, You are. (laughs) You are a deceiver. I find that so interesting. You know, I was listening to the debate And I don't know who I'm voting for, just so you know. And by the way, this coming Sunday is free speech day for pastors. They want all pastors in in our nation to just speak politically, just let let them have it and let them try to sue us. It's free speech day. That's what they want to do. I do that anyway. I don't care whether it's speech free day or not. (laughs) Um, But you, you listen to Hillary and the lies 
that she tells and she's like says it so well as though it's so true she's so deceived that she deceives herself and she believes what she's saying but she knows that it's a lie and that's how jacob is ask, acting here like he might think that well, i'm a deceiver well you are a deceiver man open your eyes and then he says i shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing i mean this just shows how much of a deceiver jacob was does jacob have a great reputation here Reputation is what people think I am. Character is what I know I am. Now, reputation is good as long as you have good character. <clears throat> but you know what I'm talking about? When someone likes to put on the facade, I want to make sure people think I'm a good guy. I want to make sure that, that I go to church and I say praise the Lord so many times and I raise my hands because I want people to think I know God and I'm worshiping Him. But in reality, you know that you're not. You know you're not in the Word. You know you're not praying. You know you struggle inside. God wants character and not reputation. Ecclesiastes 7 1 says, A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. A good reputation, yes, as long as it has character. Proverbs 22 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great wealth. Definitely, definitely. <clears throat> Timothy, in chapter 3, Paul talks about the elders and how they're supposed to have this character. He says, this man whose life should be above reproach, he must be faithful to his wife, he must exercise self-control, live wisely, and, not, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and, be, uh, and he must be able to teach, he must not be a heavy drinker, he mustn't be violent, he must be gentle. I don't like that interpretation, a heavy drinker. should be He shouldn't drink at all. Uh, he must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? An elder must not be a new believer because he might become proud. And the devil will cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. But you need character. Warren Wisby says, when reputation, which is what everybody knows about you, becomes more important than character, which is what God knows about you, we become hypocrites. We should seek character more than reputation. Because if you have good character, then you will have the reputation, right? If you're an honest person in your heart because you don't want to steal, because you know it doesn't belong to you, then people will know that you don't steal and they can trust you with their valuables. They can invite you into their home and leave you there while they go do something because they know that everything will still be in their home. Most people today, like Jacob, are concerned about reputation over character because it's all about appearances, right? It's all about appearances. It was interesting, I got a call from, I won't say their name, I'll be nice, this car rental place, and they wanted to do a survey, see how my rental went. And I just, there was no character at all in this place. And I says, not good. I don't know if you really want my, you know, question, my, my answers to, to your questions because they're not going to be good. Oh, why? What happened? And so I shared a little bit <clears throat> in how they lied, how they promised this, how they promised that, and never could deliver until I finally pulled teeth because I needed to get somewhere. I made an appointment. I called them up early to make sure my vehicle was ready to go. They said it was ready, and I get there, and they said, sit down. It's going to be hours, you know, and so it was just, it was just a whole mess, and she goes, oh, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have one of our, our general managers give you a call and, and discuss this, so I'm like, all right, <clears throat> so I get a call today, and it's the guy who was dealing with in the first place. And I'm like, you're kidding me. I, I just got a little frustrated. I said, you're kidding me. Do you know how awkward I feel talking to you about this situation when it's you that has no, no reputation whatsoever with me? He's like, oh, I'm sorry. He was totally oblivious to what I was saying. 
He was talking very, very straightforward. Oh, I really apologize. I'm so sorry that you didn't have such a good experience. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, you know, you know what? Bye. <laughs> and I just, when you have character, it will show in your reputation. How do you know what your character really is? How do I know? You'll know by what you do when no one's around. That's how you know. Oswald Chambers says, we are only what we are in the dark. All the rest is reputation. What God looks at is what we are in the dark. The imaginations of our minds and the thoughts of our hearts, the habits of our bodies, these are the things that mark us in God's sight. Character is what you are in the dark. Jacob had no, no character at all. <clears throat> His mom had no character. Isaac and Esau had no, no character either. And I find at times I have no character. Because we are flawed. We're sinners. And we fall short of the glory of God. I'm just being honest. And I hope that you can be honest with yourself and begin to pray and ask God to change our character that people would truly see our reputation, that it has a foundation, it has substance. But his mother said in verse 13 to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go and get them for me. And he went and he got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. And Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. Now, some have speculated that these were special clothes, that they were clothes, if you remember the story of um, Joseph, and he wore the coat of many colors, and so these could have been the clothes that you wear when you're going to get blessings from the Lord, and so she thought, well, let me put on the clothes of blessings on you, and your father will never know. He'll think that it is Esau, and so that's what she was doing here. And she put the skin of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth parts of his neck. And she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hands of her son Jacob. Now when your wife serves you a, your favorite meal, you have to ask, okay, what is going on here? <laughs> right? Okay, that was supposed to be funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about? The guys are like, yeah, I know what you're saying. When, it, when they're starting to be nice, and here's your favorite slippers, and you know, here's your favorite meal. It's like, okay, what do you want? <laughs> you know, what do you really want? That's when you have to beware. <laughs> Verses 18 through 29, Jacob then gets the blessing. So Jacob goes to his father, Isaac, disguises his brother Esau, and Isaac senses something's wrong here, and he asks Jacob to come a little closer so he can feel him, and then he basically uh, assumes that he is Esau and he eats the meal and gives him the blessing. So verse 18, so he went to his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am, who are you, my son? I mean, you, you would think there'd be a slight difference in their voice, but they are kind of twins, so maybe they sound alike. I don't know if twins sound alike or not. I haven't heard any studies on that, and I know they look alike. Who are you, my son? Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. Now, notice how they're intent on keeping this plan intact. They know every little detail. She heard everything. She heard everything that was said. And so when, when Jacob approaches Isaac, it's exactly what their conversation was about, go get me some savory food, bring it to me, sit down, and then I'll bless you afterwards. So Jacob was like, well, this is exactly what we spoke about. So he has no clue, but yet he's wondering here what is really going on. And Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? Well, I had a little perch up on a tree, and I fed a bunch of... <laughs> no, that's not how. Something's not right here, because the... and this is, this is what Jacob does. I mean, this is how bad it gets. And he said, because the Lord, God, had brought it to me. Ooh, 
he gets God involved now. We see Jacob bringing the Lord's name into the deception. How many times have we done that? Doesn't the Bible say this? Because we want our way. I used to do that a lot when I was younger. I would quite often say, but the Bible says this because I want my way. And there was some truth to it. Isn't that what Satan did with Jesus when tempting him in in Luke chapter 4? If you throw yourself down, will not the angels save you? And the Lord says, hey, you you shouldn't tempt the Lord your God. You don't do those things. Very manipulative. And he's at that point where he really doesn't care what the Lord has to say. But he'll use the Lord's name to get his way. A lot of people that do that today, and we talked about it on Sunday, the faith teachers. The Lord wants you wealthy. He wants you wealthy. So plant a seed of $1,000 in our ministry in the Lord's name, and he's going to bless you. Is that not using the Lord's name? Deceptively, it sure is. Be careful that when you bring the Lord into your discussions with one another, that it's in within the context of the scriptures and that it's not out of context and that you, you know, and I, I, can I suggest this? And if you have any feeling or inclination that you're using it to manipulate, don't do it. I think that's the safest thing. Even if you're right, don't do it. Because we're probably right a lot and we end up doing it and end up getting in trouble with it. So it's almost better to say, that's okay, I don't need to do that, and stepping back. It's better to be humble than to be pride with the word of the Lord. I think God will honor that. Just a suggestion. I'll pray about that. And Isaac said to Jacob, please come near, that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. And Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. So although Jacob didn't sound like Esau, he smelled like Esau because of the garment that he was wearing. Therefore, he must be Esau, thought Isaac, trusting his senses rather than hearing the words. Whenever we make decisions based upon our feelings and our emotions or our smells and our senses and not the word of the Lord, we, go, we get into trouble. We need to be aware of what God says. Important. And if you don't know what God says, then go to someone that does know and consider what they're sharing with you. If you're not quite sure, then... Ask Roman. Ask the leadership. What does this mean? Or what is this saying? Or am I taking this within the right context here? And there's nothing wrong with getting a multitude of counselors together and then making those decisions so that we make the right decisions. So he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. He said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. Reminds me of another kiss. Judas Iscariot, when he came and kissed Jesus on the cheek to reveal who he was to the centurion to the guards, the temple guards there as they took Jesus um, by force there in the Garden of Gethsemane, a kiss of deceitfulness. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothes, and he blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of the field which the Lord has blessed. So we see that Esau here will not receive the blessing. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of the heavens, of the fatness of the earth, and the plenty of grain and wine. And let the people serve you, and the nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. And that's the promise that God 
gave to Moses, to the children of Israel, right? Curse those who curse you and bless those who bless you. And that's why we, we want to bless Israel to this day. But he receives the birthright there. So then Esau finally finds an animal, kills it, and he comes back in verse 30 through 40. So verse 30, now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Boy, that was close. I mean, the, the, the Hebrew there is suggesting that as Jacob went out the door, Esau came in. Remind you of another story in Acts, Ananias and Sapphira? Yeah, and Ananias was laying dead, and as they dragged him out, Sapphira came in, and she lied. She lied just as her husband did, and then the, the Holy Spirit struck her dead too, just in the nick of time. <clears throat> so also, he also had, verse 31, he also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father rise and eat of his son's game that your soul may bless me. So now he's interested in the blessing. He wasn't interested back a while ago when we saw that he was hungry and he asked Jacob, make me or, or let me have your food so that I can fill myself because I am so hungry. Well, give me your birthright. He goes, I don't care about my birthright. You can have my birthright. And so he made a deal with him, though he didn't have the birthright in the first place, but he made a deal. But now he wants the blessing. Probably a lot older, a lot wiser. Sometimes when we're younger and we're foolish and we make promises and say things that we don't really mean and then we realize later on that it was a mistake. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where's the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. Now, I think Isaac at this point, as it says he trembled, he realized that God is in control. He realized that he had made a mistake. That God had said that Jacob would have the blessing and that he tried to give it to Esau. And it says he trembled. He said, it's too late. The blessing is already gone. And it's gone to the person that God had intended it to go to. So he tried his best to figure out how to manipulate it and twist it, but the word of the Lord stands. And the word of the Lord will always stand, no matter what. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me also, O my father. Now, now in the Hebrew here, this word here is emphatic. So he's describing about a painful, plain wailing in his spirit. He really wanted this blessing at this point. And he is screaming it out to his father. Is there, I'm not going to scream, but is there not something for me? Anything? This is not fair. This is not right. Here is this man of the earth, a hunter, a hairy, big guy, and he's sobbing like a baby because he's not getting what he wants. I don't really believe that he's crying from a heart of repentance. He's crying from a heart of sorrow, worldly sorrow, because he's not getting a blessing. But he said, your brother came, that is Isaac, came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. Again, the accusation that, that they're deceitful when in reality he's the one that's deceitful also. Amazing. Amazing. That just blows my mind. It's like my lie is better than your lie because your lie is bigger and my lie is not that big. So you're the liar, not me. But they're both lying. They're both deceitful. And Esau said, he is not rightly named Jacob, or is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times. He's referring to the first time he took his birthright, birthright away, and now he took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessings. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Again, he's, he's just pleading something, something for me. 
The word Jacob means hill catcher, and then in time the translation can mean surplanter. The idea is of catching a person by the heels and tripping them up as you pass them by. It would be like being in a race, and you're getting close to the finish line, and you're all close together, and you see an opportunity, and you put your foot in front of someone to trip them so that you can go past them. And that's what Jacob was doing. That's what his reputation was, because he had no character. But Esau was probably worse than that. Hebrews gives us some insight in chapter 12, verse 16 and 17. It says, Least there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. God called him a fornicator and a profane person because he sold his birthright. But they were just kids. You know, youth, they make foolish vows and do stupid things. That's how we view it sometimes, but God doesn't view it that way. Sin is sin. That's why he says we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And we will be held accountable. Hebrews goes on and says, for ye know how that afterwards when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. God literally rejected Esau. He rejected him. How would that make you feel? A man of the flesh, a man of the world, a man that felt as though he had the blessing and God took that blessing away from him. For he found no place of repentance, it says, though he sought it carefully with tears. So there was no place of repentance for him. So his heart really was not to repent, but it was worldly sorrow as Paul talks about that in Corinthians there is there is godly sorrow and then there is worldly sorrow godly sorrow leads you to repentance that it it leads you to make things right to do whatever it takes to gain back your reputation by living out your life with a character That's true change. That's repentance. That's how we're saved, right? We repent. We turn from this world and we turn to God. We turn from our old life and we turn to the Lord and walk in His direction. That's something that we sometimes leave out when we do altar calls and we call people, come to Jesus, confess Him and you'll be saved. But there's more to it than that because the Bible says repent and turn from your ways. And so there's a point in your life where, yeah, you come to Jesus and and you accept him to be saved, but now that Holy Spirit comes in you and he now directs you to turn from your old life and turn to the Lord now. Because you're so appreciative that God has saved you from your sins that now you want to serve him. You no longer want to live in this world. The mystery has been revealed and the purpose in life. And too many think, well, now I'm saved. I can go back to living the way I want. No, that's not, that's not how it works. There has to be repentance turning from your old life. The evidence and the fruit has to be there. And so you must be born again. So the old nature is gone and the new nature, Paul says, comes through. And it's no longer circumcision, but it's circumcision of the heart. The heart has changed completely. So now you're aware of your faults and your sins, and it grieves you. It grieves you to continue to sin that way because God is trying to remove that sin from your life. It may take a while, but it grieves you. So he didn't seek true true repentance. Back to Genesis 37. Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain, wine, I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Isaac, or I'm sorry, Esau lifted up his voice and he wept. I mean, in the Hebrew, you can you can hear the pleading of his heart. But again, as as Hebrew explains, it wasn't true repentance there. Sometimes people will plead with you and plead with you, but it's not true repentance. And you have to hold them to that true repentance biblically. 
You need to make it clear. You need to repent. You need to make things right. You can't just come and say, I am sorry. You need to now work at changing that. That's hard to do. It's hard to do. Esau missed out on the blessings. There's no more blessings. There's blessings for us, though, today, isn't there? God has so many blessings. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 14 talks about all the blessings of God He's bestowed upon us. Our Father has given us all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. We are blessed by grace through faith or faith through grace. So Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, verse 39, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and the dew of the heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. And I think we see that today. We see what's going on in the Middle East. So Esau actually later on moves to Edom, and we've heard that word before, Edom, or the Edomites, and they become an adversary against Israel. Herod the Great was an Edomite. He was an Edomite, and he fought against uh, the Jews. He was trying to put himself as king over them. Um, The Edomites moved into the Roman government, and today, guess where the Edomites are? In Rome. And it's just an insight. Think about this. You might have to do some studying. But the Antichrist comes from where? Rome. And wouldn't it be appropriate for Esau and Jacob to be at battle again. It makes sense. <clears throat> and so the Antichrist will probably be an Edomite who will rise up from Rome to come against the Jews. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him, verse 41. And Esau said in his heart, the day of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. There's the battle of two nations against one another. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heath. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Hith, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? So she complains to, to Isaac and finds an excuse to send him away. I don't, want, I don't want Jacob to marry these daughters. I don't want him unequally yoked. I don't want them leading him astray. He needs to stay within the family line. So let's send him to our brothers place there. Not like Esau who's marrying these women here in the land. So unequally yoked is not good. And so she uses that as an excuse to send uh, him away. And so he goes away. Unfortunately, she thought it would be for a few years. And it turns out that it's a lot more than that. And she dies never seeing Jacob again. So there are consequences for our actions. If she would have just trusted in God and in his plan and his timing everything probably would have worked out a lot differently. But God has a way of working out things for his good, for his purpose. And he will take our mistakes through grace and mercy and he will work them out. Let me close. When you look at Jacob pulling the wool over his father's failing eyes, look at him particularly in verses 18 through 25, willing to go to unbelievable lengths to lie to lie about himself, to even use the name of the Lord to bring in uh, his deceptive ways. Those are things that we should not be involved in. We need to just trust in the Lord that he has a plan and a purpose and that he will fulfill it in his timing and in his way. I'm excited at what God is doing 
in this church right now. Because, and I'll tell you why, because I have no control over it. It's not something that I can fabricate. It's something that God is just doing. I was sharing the story today. I had a meeting with the, a surprise meeting with the Gideons. They just showed up. And um, I shared with them uh, what was going on because they asked me if there was anything to pray for me. And I told them that I'm going to be having a meeting on Monday because this young man, Forrest, has just opened up doors. And one of the guys was like, his mouth was open like, I am blown away by this. Wow. He was just totally blown away at what God was doing here. And when you tell the story, that's how people are reacting. It's like, what? It's not like you and what you're doing. No, this is what God is doing. And we have to be sensitive to the Spirit as he's leading and guiding us. I, mean, I think of the Apostle Paul who stood before King Agrippa. Before King Agrippa. And he shared the gospel. And those are the opportunities that we get. Roman got the opportunity to share with a group of young men who are excited, who make videos, and that's the opportunity. And that may go further than, than that. Carlos just shared a praise report that uh, the city of Rupa Valley <clears throat> is going to consider uh, making a, a bicycle lane. I guess they're going to bring it up to the board, discuss that. So just, just things that are happening, and we get to participate in it, be a part of it. And God get this little church's name out there so that people hopefully will be drawn to the kingdom of God. Not this church, though there's nothing wrong with this church. And there's nothing wrong with God using this church. And there's nothing wrong with us getting people here to build his kingdom because that's what we want to do. I don't want to miss that opportunity either because we're like, well, we're about Jesus, you know, only not our church. Well, this is where Jesus has us. This is where he called us, and this is the people that he has here. So, yeah, let's build his church here, just as others are building their churches there. Yes, it's about Jesus. That's all that it's about, and we're a part of the body of Christ. We might be an insignificant part, but that's okay. We're still a part, and, and we're going to build that part the best that we can because God has called us to do that here. But we don't have to do that by manipulating, by deceiving. We just do it as the Spirit is leading us and the plan unfolds.